सब्सक्राइब टू आर यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी वीडियो लेसन फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल नाउ वी आर ऑल्सो अवेलेबल ऑन टेलीग्राम सो ज्वाइन आर टेलीग्राम चैनल बाई क्लिकिंग ऑन द लिंक दट इज अवेलेबल इन द डिस्क्रिप्शन बिलो टू गेट द लेटेस्ट अपडेट फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल Now all of us understand the importance of optional subject in overall scheme of UPSC civil services examination. And if you are confused about which optional subject to choose, how to find the best teachers and academic support for your optional papers and above all how to prepare for the same during these difficult times, Rao's IS has best solution for your optional subject related problems. We are conducting optional orientation sessions on 22nd and 29th of May 2021 in which you can learn from the Rao's IS teachers about how to prepare for the optional subjects and how are we going to help you in scoring your best in the mains examination. The optional batches are starting from 4th of June 2021 via live online classes. Consider this as a call to all of those who wish to completely cover the optional subject by December 2021. This will ensure timely coverage of optional subject and then you can focus your attention completely on prelims from January or February 2022 and keep revising the optional subject till you appear for the mains examination. Rao's IS is offering guidance for political science, public administration, history, sociology, geography, economics and psychology from Delhi, Jaipur and Bangalore centers. In the description of the video there is a link which you can use to register yourself for the orientation for the respective optional subject session. We at Rao's IS are committed to give you the best guidance and academic support to excel in civil services examination. Join the orientation and kick start your mains optional subject preparation from a team of best teachers in the arena. Let us now begin the discussion. Hello and welcome to the weekly explained section from the Indian Express. in this discussion we will be taking up these articles that are displayed on your screen from the explained section of the indian express which have not already been covered in the daily news simplified videos so let us start the discussion of these important topics which are important for us from both prelims as well as mains examination perspective now this article that you see on your screen was published in the indian express explained section and it reads the federal reserve's plan for cryptocurrencies and why it is significant Now Federal Reserve here relates to the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States of America and it is likely to come out with a white paper on its plan for any central bank digital currency that it is likely to issue from the United States of America. Now there has been a lot of buzz about the central bank digital currencies or the cryptocurrencies and the fall in the value of cryptocurrencies of late. One of the prominent reasons for the fall in the value of cryptocurrencies was because the Chinese government banned its banks to trade in any kind of cryptocurrencies or it indirectly banned all kinds of transactions that were leading their way into trade into cryptocurrencies so for example if a chinese bank was allowing transactions which were allowing the people of china to trade into cryptocurrencies so china has effectively banned that kind of transaction so that is why because of this ban that was imposed by china recently there has been fall in the value of cryptocurrency because it is a measure that is aimed at discouraging the participation of common population in the cryptocurrencies across the globe so this is one way in which china is trying to control you might all be aware that rbi had banned the cryptocurrency trade in india as well back in 2018 however the supreme court struck down this circular that was issued by the rbi banning trade in cryptocurrencies in 2020 so currently there is no policy or no circular regarding is the trade allowed in cryptocurrencies or not and the amount of investment that indian population has in cryptocurrency stands at about 10000 crore which is a very huge number at this point now one of the prominent point outside the cryptocurrency domain is that the central banks of various countries are now issuing what is called as the central bank digital currencies and china is one of the major economies that had introduced the central bank digital currency back in 2020 and we have often been hearing that the central banks are issuing these digital currencies out of fear of the cryptocurrencies and also they are likely to deploy the blockchain technology for the release of such central bank digital currencies so what are the common questions that come into our mind 
when we hear the term central bank digital currencies? Let us look at those questions first. So the common questions that come into our mind regarding the digital central bank currency is that how is it different from the regular cash that we are using or how is it different from the digital currency that we are presently using by the way of credit cards or by the way of various digital payment applications. The second question that comes up in our mind is that are these digital central bank currencies same as the cryptocurrency and if they are not the same as cryptocurrency how are these different? Further, what is the technology that is likely to be used for the creation of central bank digital currency? Also, why are the central banks pushing so hard for the introduction of the digital central bank currency? Also, how would it change the present financial system and what are the associated concerns regarding the introduction of such central bank digital currency? You might also have heard that the RBI is also taking keen interest in the release or the introduction of digital central bank currency and already a lot of research is going on regarding this and RBI has clearly shown its intent in the use of blockchain or the distributed ledger technologies for the introduction of such digital central bank currency. So in this discussion we will try to answer most of the questions and the concerns regarding the digital central bank currency and all important aspects of the introduction of such digital central bank currency. In this regard China has already issued its digital central bank currency and it is likely to be rolled out in a phased manner. Also we note that RBI has been taking keen interest in the introduction of digital central bank currency and the present news article is also related to the interest that has been shown by the Federal Reserve of United States of America regarding such digital central bank currency. And that is why this can be one important topic for us from both preliminary as well as the mains examination perspective. So let us understand some basic aspects of the digital central bank currency first. But before understanding what is meant by the digital central bank currency, let us first understand what is money itself. So basically money is an accepted medium of exchange for goods and services. As we all know that we have been using cash and coins as an exchange for goods and services. And that is why it is an accepted medium of exchange for goods and services. Secondly, money performs three major functions. These are, it acts as a medium of exchange. Secondly, it is a store of value. And thirdly, it is a unit of accounting. So as we have already learned that we are using cash and coins as a medium of exchange. Also money acts as a store of value. So the amount of money or the cash that you are holding is basically the value of money that you hold. And also it is easier to make as a unit of accounting. That is why these are the three major functions of money. Now this brings us to next important question as to what is fiat money and what is legal tender money. Now normally we can accept gold, silver or any valuable item as a money. But then what was the need of printing currency notes or coins? Now one of the biggest concerns was that all these valuable items like gold, silver etc. they are limited in stock. And that is why fiat money was introduced and which does not have any intrinsic value. And as such any amount of fiat money can be produced by the central banks in this regard. So the currency notes and the coins that we use are often called as fiat money. Why? Because they do not have any intrinsic value like gold or silver. So as we all know that the paper on which the money is printed does not have any intrinsic value like gold or silver. However, it has value because it is backed by the central banks and that is why the money which does not have any intrinsic value in the form of cash or notes is known as fiat money. Now such fiat money is also called as legal tender money that is because such money cannot be refused by any citizen of the country for settlement of any kind of transaction. So this is one important aspect. UPSC has already asked the question regarding what is meant by legal tender and this question was asked back in 2018. So now as we are clear with what is money, what are the main functions that are performed by money and also what is fiat money and legal tender money, let us understand how is central digital bank currency related to all these concepts. For greater understanding of these concepts, you can always go through the NCRT of macroeconomics of class 11th. 
So central digital bank currency is nothing but a digital form of country's fiat currency. That is, it is also a claim on the central bank. So similar to the fiat currency that is being produced in the form of cash, notes and coins, the digital currency will also be another kind or type of fiat currency that is issued by a central bank. Now, as in case of fiat currency, which is published by the central banks, we have a claim on the central bank. That is how or in a similar manner, the digital form of the currency or the digital currency will also have a claim on the central bank and that makes it a legal tender as well. So instead of printing money, the central bank will now issue electronic coins or accounts that are backed by full faith and credit of the government. So just like currency notes issued by the central bank, the central digital bank currency is also a legal tender and it will be accepted for payment of various transactions within the country. So the central digital bank currency or the central bank digital currency fulfills both the norms of being a fiat currency because it will not have any intrinsic value. Secondly, it will also be a legal tender that is it will be accepted for payment of various transactions within the country. Now how are these central bank digital currencies compared to the cryptocurrencies? Now we have been hearing that cryptocurrencies are democratic in nature because they are based on blockchain technology and they do not have backing of any central bank. And that exactly is the reason that their value is very instable. So unlike the cryptocurrencies, the central bank digital currency is backed by central bank and that is why they are supposed to enjoy more amount of stability and they will be less volatile as compared to the cryptocurrency. So while defining a central bank digital currency, we see that it is similar to fiat currency. It will also be a legal tender. And as compared to cryptocurrency, they will have the backing of central bank. That is, they are not democratic in nature or they are not distributed in the manner as which the cryptocurrencies are distributed. Now, we already have been using the digital cash. So how will the central bank digital currency be different from the present digital cash that we are using? So we are already using debit or credit card or the payment apps to purchase any kind of things or make payments in the shops in the form of digital money. But this kind of digital money in the form of debit card, credit card or payment app has been created by the commercial banks and not by the central banks. And these commercial banks have created this digital money based on the central bank money that is credited to their accounts. So as we have already been using the digital cash that was being created by the commercial banks, how is the central bank digital currency different from the present digital cash that we are using? So the biggest difference between the two types of digital cash is that the digital currency that is backed by the central banks is a little bit risk free. This is because the commercial banks can crash at times and they might not be able to repay all the digital cash that you owe to those banks. And that is why we note that in such cases, the central bank comes to their rescue. However, as here the digital cash is being given out by the central bank itself, that is why it is considered as relatively risk free. So the difference is that the digital currency that is published or released by the central bank is relatively risk free. And in case of commercial banks, if the commercial banks fail, only a limited amount of money is insured. We have seen that a lot of cases of bank failures have happened in India, especially in the banks in Pune, where only a limited amount of money was insured. So that is why this makes the digital currency that is published by the central banks a relatively risk free enterprise as compared to the digital currency or digital cash that is created by the commercial banks. Now this brings us to next very important question as to why are the central banks taking such keen interest in the digital currency? What exactly is making the central banks to introduce the digital currency in the first place? The first fear that the central banks are facing these days is that they will be losing control over the supply of money and the payment systems to the cryptocurrencies. And as we all know that the cryptocurrencies are being accepted worldwide and that is why a lot of trade is happening in these cryptocurrencies. Also, such cryptocurrencies do not have any central authority and they are distributed in nature. That is, they are democratic in nature because there is no central authority governing such cryptocurrencies. So as more and more people take interest in the cryptocurrencies and invest in cryptocurrencies, the central bank fears that or the central banks fear that 
they might be losing control over the supply of money and the payment systems in the economy. We already know that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and the one that is backed by Facebook that is presently it is known as Dime, earlier it was named as Libra. So there are multiple cryptocurrencies that are in circulation and they are being widely accepted by the people and that is what is making the central banks vary that they might lose their control that they have presently over the supply of money and the payment systems. And as these cryptocurrencies are beyond the control of the central banks, they might lose their grip on the supply of money and the economic stability. So the biggest threat is because of the increasing acceptance of the cryptocurrencies and that is what is driving the central banks to release their own digital currencies. The second important reason is that as the economies are moving away from cash, that is they are becoming more and more cashless, that is why the central banks are bringing out these digital currencies at this point. And these digital currencies could offer a new tool for the central banks to transmit monetary policy and keep the economy stable. So because of the disruption that has been created by the cryptocurrencies, the central banks are fearing that they will lose control over the supply of money and that is why by the introduction of digital currencies, the central banks are trying to introduce a new kind of monetary policy tool that will keep or help in keeping the economy stable over a period of time. So how exactly would a digital currency look like? So simply it could take the form of a token saved on a mobile phone or a prepaid card. And it could also exist in an account that is directly managed by the central bank or an intermediary on behalf of the central banks. So as a lot of discussion is going on about the digital currencies, these are few forms that are speculated to be taking the form of digital currency that is issued by the central banks. This brings us to the next very important question as to what kind of technology will be used for the introduction of such central bank digital currencies. In this we have all been listening that the blockchain technology which is being used by the cryptocurrencies is likely to be used by the central bank digital currencies. But for that, let us first try and understand what is meant by the blockchain technology or what is meant by the distributed ledger technology and how are the distributed ledger technologies different from the existing technologies that are prevalent that is centralized database or centralized ledger system. In this regard, you all might be knowing that ledger is simply a way of accounting or keeping the records of accounts. And presently in the computerized system, a centralized database system is being used which is known as centralized ledger. In this, a central clearing house has the authority of approving any kind of transaction. So the final authority in case of a centralized database system or the centralized ledger system is the central authority or the clearing house that is at the center of such kind of a database. And it is without the approval of the central authority, no changes can be made in the database. That is, all the four cannot make these changes independently and their approval is not required for making any change in the central database. However, this is different from the case in which distributed ledger system is adopted. Now, what is this distributed ledger system or the distributed ledger technology? So, the distributed ledger technology or the distributed ledger database is spread across several nodes or devices on a peer-to-peer -peer network where each replicates and saves an identical copy of the ledger and updates itself independently. So in this diagram, if you see that this is one of the way in which distributed ledger technologies can work. And if any change has to be made in any one of the node, it has to be approved by all the other nodes that exist in this particular system. So if one change is being introduced in this particular node, it will have to be introduced in all the other nodes that exist there. And also at the same time, a consensus is created by the way of voting or permission that is granted by all these other nodes here. So as you can clearly see that it is different from the centralized ledger system where if you want to make a change in any of the node, it has to be approved by the central authority or the clearing house only. And there is no role of other peers that exist in this particular network. So what is the primary advantage of having such a distributed ledger technology? First is that there is lack of central authority and it works on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Further, if any change is done at any node in such kind of distributed ledger database, 
each node constructs the new transaction and then the nodes vote by consensus algorithm on which the copy is correct. So basically, it is a peer-to-peer -peer network system in which a consensus has to be established. That is, any change in any one node has to be approved by all the other nodes that exist in that particular network. And once the consensus has been determined or the permission has been granted by all the nodes, all the other nodes update themselves with the new correct copy of the lecture. And how is the security established in such a network? So it is established through cryptographic keys or signatures. Now cryptography is simply a way of encoding any kind of information. So this is basically a tag system or a hash system. For example, if you want to store any information about a particular person P, then you can create any kind of code or cryptographic code for securing or encrypting this particular information related to this person. So this can be in any form. For example, simply you can denote it by A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this can be one way of encrypting the information that is there. So these are cryptographic keys or signatures that are used to secure the existing information. Now we all know that the cryptography or the encryption system is already widely used. But what makes distributed ledger technology important or safe is the peer-to-peer -peer review and the consensus algorithm that exists in such kind of distributed ledger technology. And that is why such distributed ledger technology or distributed ledger database have a clear advantage in terms of safety and security over the earlier database system that was centralized in nature. Further, it needs to be understood that not all digital ledger technologies are blockchain technology, but blockchain technology is just one type of digital ledger technology. So this is a very important fact that we need to understand that blockchain technology is just a type of distributed ledger technology. Now, what exactly is the difference between distributed ledger technology and the blockchain technology? Let us understand this. So basically, blockchain is just a form of distributed ledger technology and it comprises of immutable digitally recorded data stored in packages which are called as the blocks. Regarding DLT or the distributed ledger technology, it is a record of consensus maintained and validated by multiple parties or nodes. So the key difference is that it is in the form of blocks which are linked to each other in the form of chain. So this is just one type of distributed ledger technology. However, in case of DLT, as we have seen in the diagram, there can be a mixed form in which the nodes are arranged. Secondly, it uses cryptography to make it hard for a malicious user to manipulate the results in his own favor. The DLT is a, a way to construct a ledger in a decentralized way to achieve consensus among the participants who don't trust each other. So as we all know that it is distributed and democratic and is not centralized in nature. Thirdly, it is a way to implement a distributed ledger. However, not all distributed ledgers necessarily employ blockchains. So this is a very important fact that you need to learn that blockchain technology is just one type of distributed ledger technology. Also in the distributed ledger technology, it records new information in real time and only adds new entries if consensus among the participants is confirmed. So the consensus of all the nodes in a network is necessary in the DLT and similarly, this is also necessary in case of blockchain where the blocks of information are arranged in a chained manner. Further, every entry is automatically timestamped using a unique cryptographic signature. So here, blockchain technology is simply a subset of the digital ledger technology, which is a wider term that is used for the networks which deploy consensus mechanism and also peer-to-peer -peer review and secure information. The only major difference is that in terms of the way in which the blocks of information are arranged. In a blockchain, they are arranged in a chained manner. However, in the DLT, they can be arranged in any kind of manner. Now to understand how the blockchain technology works, what is the role of cryptography in such kind of blockchains and how the blockchains are being utilized in the cryptocurrency, you can go through the DNS of 10 September 2020 where all the basic aspects of blockchain technology have been discussed in quite a detail. Do go through that. And there we have discussed the basics of a blockchain technology and how a block is created. So in a block, there is data, there is hash, which is basically the cryptographic signature or the cryptographic tree related to that particular block. 
further any block that is there in a chain in the blockchain also has the hash or the cryptographic information of the previous block and that is why if you want to make a change in any of the block that exists within the chain then you will have to make the change in all the other blocks that exist in the particular blockchain that is why it becomes very difficult to introduce any kind of change in the blockchain do go through that discussion you will have more clarity on how the blockchain system works now after looking at the different type of technologies that are available in the form of centralized database or distributed ledger technology or the blockchain technology let us look at is the distributed ledger technology or blockchain technology necessary for the introduction of any central bank digital currency so are all the central bank digital currencies or will all the central bank digital currencies deploy blockchain is it necessary or not let us look at this particular aspect so according to all the research papers or the news articles that have appeared there is nothing to say that it should always use blockchain or the distributed ledger technologies now we all know that blockchain is being used presently in almost all the cryptocurrencies that are in circulation however it is not necessary that the central bank digital currencies will also use the blockchain technology this is one of the important facts that you need to learn about the central bank digital currencies secondly the central bank digital currencies can essentially be any non physical digital token that is issued by central bank to substitute a cash that is not necessarily it will deploy blockchain or the distributed ledger technology now one of the examples of the central bank digital currency that does not deploy blockchain or the distributed ledger technology is the digital currency that has been published or being introduced by the people's bank of china or the chinese government and it is saying that its digital yuan would not rely on the blockchain technology however in case of sweden which is also in an experimental phase to introduce a digital currency is saying that they are deploying or using the blockchain technology for the creation of such central bank digital currency so the conclusion here is that the central bank could rely upon any existing technology to issue e money without relying on the distributed ledger technology so in contrast to the traditional decentralized cryptocurrencies a central bank digital currency is likely to be introduced on a permissioned blockchain network which means that the central bank will likely appoint specific authorities which will then approve the transaction to be recorded on that particular blockchain or on the distributed ledger technologies so for example the central banks can create specific authorities within their system and from there on such authority will decide the introduction or the creation of such central bank digital currency so the central banks can deploy the distributed ledger technology or blockchain technology however they can already rely on the existing central database system or the centralized ledger system to create such central bank digital currency so not necessarily they will be deploying the dlt or the blockchain technology so what is the alternative so the alternative that is available with the central banks is that they will appoint specific authorities that will function as nodes and they will then approve the transactions to be recorded on a blockchain so only limited authority will be provided to specific people in order to approve transactions that are recorded in the blockchain network that is created by the central banks so that is one way of using blockchain technology for the introduction of central bank digital currency however if the central bank appoints specific authorities it will in turn reduce the authority of the central bank itself so that is one of the concerns of the central banks in using the distributed ledger technologies or the blockchain technology so this is clearly one of the area of concern for the central banks now this brings us to another important aspect in the central bank digital currencies that is what is the likely benefit of introduction of such central bank digital currencies now we all know that countries are now moving away from cash into cashless transactions so that is why it will ensure public access to legal tender if the cash was phased out by the central banks secondly it will help in improving the transition towards a cashless society which exactly is the goal of almost all the countries across the globe thirdly it will break the monopoly of the cryptocurrencies presently we all know that lot of people are taking interest in the cryptocurrencies which are not backed by any asset or are not backed by central banks so the idea is that the central banks want to break the monopoly of the cryptocurrencies and that is why as a competition they have introduced the central bank digital currencies 
Further, by the introduction of central bank digital currencies, the central banks aim at bringing in the financial stability. Because if the cryptocurrencies keep on being traded upon by the people of the country and if they are not backed by any assets, this can lead to financial instability. So in order to move away from the cryptocurrencies or discourage people from using cryptocurrency, the central governments on the one hand are banning the cryptocurrencies and on the other hand they are introducing these central bank digital currencies. Further it aims at increasing the financial inclusion. So as the cash economy gives way to the digital economy, it will ultimately lead to financial inclusion because that will lead to opening of the bank accounts or opening of the accounts with the central bank itself. So that will increase the financial inclusion in developing countries. Now it is also being touted as an effective means of or increasing the efficiency of the monetary policy. Now presently we all know that for transmission of monetary policy, the central banks are relying on the intermediaries or the banks. And the effectiveness of the monetary policy depends upon the way in which the banks are making changes to its lending rates based on the policy rates that are announced by the central banks. So by introduction of digital currency, such need might be done away with. And that exactly will be very beneficial in case of effective monetary policy transmission. Further, it will give a push to the development of fintech sector because already we note that a lot of financial technology firms or apps are there in the use and they will then directly use the opportunity that is created by such digital currency introduced by the central banks. Further, it is expected that such a central digital bank currency will provide a real-time picture of the economic activity and hence it will better provide the GDP estimates and efficient monetary policy transformation. Also, it will help in traceability of the transactions and would help in cracking down on corruption and money laundering. So basically when the digital currency is introduced and the cash is done away with or reduced in circulation, the black economy will be hurt badly and that is how it can be cracked down and there can be a crackdown on corruption and the money laundering that exists in the economy. Now although the central bank digital currencies are being touted as a major improvement in the financial sector, what are some of the concerns regarding the introduction of such central bank digital currency? First is that because of complex technological design and policy issues associated with the introduction of such technology, there could be hurdles in the implementation of such kind of digital currency. And we already note that some countries are even skeptical about the introduction of such currencies. And at the same time, even those countries that are introducing the digital currencies are doing it in a phased manner. Second important concern regarding the central bank digital currency is that it could adversely impact the banking sector. We all know that the banking sector is known to be conducting what is known as intermediation. So with the introduction of digital currencies, it is being said that there will be disintermediation that is it will have adverse impact on the banking sector and this is because the consumers are likely to shift their deposits from the banks into the central banks now as the central bank will be introducing this currency directly into the hands of people there will be a competition between the central bank and the banks for a deposit and as such to attract deposits the banking sector will now have to provide higher rates of interest and this would in turn lead to costly lending by the banks and this can reduce the profitability of the banking sector considerably because people will naturally choose central banks over the commercial banks because they will consider the account with the central bank as more risk free. Then there are issues related to privacy also. We all know that the cash payments afford citizens with some kind of anonymity and privacy. However, the digital currencies may not be able to provide such kind of anonymity and privacy. Further, we note that by the introduction of these digital currencies, the central banks will require the people to comply with anti-money laundering regimes. For example, we have Anti-Money Laundering Act. So because of such measures introduced with the aim of anti-money laundering, the digital currency will not have or will not function on the principle or concept of anonymity as was seen in the case of cash payments. However, one of the biggest concern here is that such digital nature of the digital currency makes it easy for the government surveillance. So by this or introduction of digital currency, the government surveillance will be increased very much. And this is seen as a violation of the right to privacy of the citizens. Also, this may enable the governments to track and suppress the political dissent. 
and we have seen the tendencies of the governments of surveillance and tracking its citizens in the way in which electoral bonds have been introduced in our economy. Further, if the central banks do not make use of blockchain or the, digit or the distributed ledger technologies, and if they use the centralized digital database system, such kind of adoption of technology will make it vulnerable to cyber attacks. So it could particularly be attractive to those who intend to disrupt the economy by attacking the payment systems itself. So ensuring high standards of cybersecurity is essential for any country that is dealing with central bank digital currency. So in this discussion, we have clearly seen different aspects of central bank digital currency, how it relates to the existing money system, how is it a form of fiat money, how is it legal tender, and why is the central banks or why are the central banks keen on introduction of such digital currency? Also, what are the different types of technologies that are available and which technology is going to be used for the introduction of central bank digital currency? Finally, we have looked at some of the advantages and also some of the concerns regarding the introduction of such technology or such digital currency. With this, let's take up the next news article now. The next important news that was there in the Indian Express Explained section was related to social media and what is meant by this term safe harbor. Now these terms have been in use because of the new social media regulation rules that have been introduced by the central government. They were first introduced in February and they have now been started to implement. And if you go through the previous year question papers, you will find that this particular question was asked in the year 2017 and it was related to cyber security incidents. So similarly, we can be asked questions related to social media regulation and the new rules that have been introduced. However, this term safe harbor is particularly important. So let us look at this practice question. It reads the safe harbor sometimes seen in the context of social media refers to which of the following. So you try to answer this question after going through the discussion. So intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code has been introduced by the central government as far as the regulation of social media and the regulation of over the top platforms or the OTT platforms is concerned in India. Now all the aspects of these social media related guidelines and the digital media ethics code, we have already discussed them in detail in the DNS of 26 February 2021. So for learning about the new regulations that have been introduced, and the digital media ethics code related to OTT platforms, you should go through the DNS of 26 February 2021, where we have discussed additional due diligence that needs to be followed by the social media intermediaries. Now, simply social media intermediaries are the platforms that we are using for our daily social media usage. In this, the government wants appointment of a chief compliance officer, nodal contact person, resident grievance officer, and a monthly compliance report is also to be published. Further, there are various other provisions that make the social media intermediaries accountable based on these important rules and regulations that have been introduced by the government of India. Now, some of the important social media intermediaries are reluctant to abide with these rules that have been brought out by the government. So what if any social media intermediary does not comply with such rules that have been brought out by the government of India? So failure to comply with any one of these requirements would take away the indemnity that is provided to social media intermediaries under the section 79 of the Information Technology Act. Now the indemnity simply means the protection or the security that has been provided to these social media intermediaries under the section 79 of the Information Technology Act. And this is famously known as the safe harbor provision that is there in the Information Technology Act of India under the section 79 which provides indemnity to the social media intermediaries. However, if they fail to comply with these new requirements, such kind of security or indemnity will be done away with. Now what is this section 79 of the Information Technology Act of India? Now section 79 simply says that any intermediary or any social media intermediary shall not be held legally or otherwise liable for any third party information, data or communication link that is made available or hosted on its platform. So any information, data or communication link that is available or hosted on the platform of the social media intermediary, in such a case, such social media intermediary shall not be held legally liable or legally responsible. Now this protection shall be applicable 
if the said social media intermediary does not in any way initiate the transmission of the message in question, select the receiver of the transmitted message and does not modify any information contained in the transmission. So basically, if the social media platform has not initiated the transmission of the message in question, secondly, it has not selected the receiver of the transmitted message, that is, it limits the reach of such kind of message. And thirdly, it does not modify any information that is contained in the transmission. So if the social media intermediary complies with all these three rules, it will be provided protection or indemnity against prosecution under the Information Technology Act. And these provisions are popularly known as the safe harbor rules that are there in the Information Technology Act. And these are applicable for the social media intermediaries in India. However, when is such protection not available to these intermediaries? So the protection is not granted if the intermediary, despite being informed or notified by the government or its agencies, does not immediately disable the access to material that has been asked by the central government. Further, the intermediary must not temper with any evidence of these messages or the content present on its platform, failing which it will lose its protection under the IT Act. Now, when was such protection provided or was it provided initially in the Information Technology Act itself? No, it was not there, but it was introduced by the way of an amendment in the Information Technology Act and the Section 79 was introduced. And this was introduced after a Supreme Court verdict that came out in 2012. And it held that the executives of the social media intermediary shall not be held accountable since they are directly not involved in the generation of the messages being transmitted on their platform. So basically it was based on the verdict that was given out by the Supreme Court back in 2012. A new section was introduced which is known as the section 79 in the Information Technology Act and that is popularly known as the safe harbor provision that is there in the IT Act in India. So what are the issues with the new rules that have been introduced and why are some social media intermediaries not complying with such rules? So social media intermediaries such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram have so far not appointed a resident grievance officer, chief compliance officer or a nodal contact person as was required in the new laws. And the rule 4A of these IT rules mandates that significant social media intermediaries must appoint such chief compliance officer. And these officers would be held liable in case of intermediary fails to observe the due diligence requirements that were provided for in the new rules that have been introduced. That is why the protection under section 79 of the IT Act will not hold for them according to the government of India. Now are these safe harbor rules unique to India? or they have only been provided in the Information Technology Act in India by the introduction of Section 79. No, they already exist at a global level. So what are the global safe harbor norms for the protection of social media intermediaries? So in the United States of America, Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act provides internet companies a safe harbor from any content that the users post on these platforms. What these rules provide? They provide that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So this effectively means that the intermediary shall only be like a bookstore owner who cannot be held accountable for the books in the store unless it is proven that there is a connection between the writer or the publisher of the book and the bookstore owner. So basically, in United States of America's Communications Decency Act of 1996, already such safe harbor provisions have been provided in the United States of America. So similarly, in the Information Technology Act, by the way of introduction of Section 79, the safe harbor rules were also provided. So let us look at this question. So the safe harbor sometimes seen in the context of social media refers to which of the following? Firstly, safety provided to the citizens under the new social media rules. Secondly, the government posts on social media cannot be removed by the intermediaries. Thirdly, social media intermediaries have indemnity under the Information Technology Act. So this is the correct answer based on the discussion that we have just gone through. With this, let's take up the next news article now. Now the next article that we are taking up from the Indian Express Explained section is why the edible oils are costlier and what is the way forward. 
Now, this news has come up in the context of the rise in the prices of six edible oils in India. And the prices of these edible oils have risen sharply as you can see in this graph here. So as compared to last year, the groundnut oil price has increased by about 20%. In case of mustard oil, this rise in price is about 44%. For Vanaspati, soya, sunflower oil and palm oil, the rise in the prices is 45%, 52%, 56% and 54% respectively. So these figures that have been provided by the Consumer Affairs Ministry highlight that the prices of the edible oil have increased drastically as compared to last year. So what exactly is causing this rise in the prices? Let us look at all these factors. And if you go through the previous year question papers, you will find that consecutively in the years 2018 and in the year 2019, UPSC has asked questions regarding the import of edible oil in India. For example, this question that was asked in 2018 read, the quantity of imported edible oils is more than the domestic production of edible oils in the last five years, which was correct. Second is that the government does not impose any customs duty on all the imported edible oils as a special case was not right. The question that was asked in 2019 read among the agricultural commodities imported by India, which of the following accounts for highest imports in terms of value in the last five years? And of course, it was vegetable oils. Now, all these aspects, although they are also covered in the agriculture section in the economic survey discussion, but let's look at the present context where the rise in price has been related to edible oils and what exactly is causing this rise in the prices of edible oils. So let us first look at the oil seeds profile of India or how the oil is produced and which all oil seeds are used for production of oils. So there are primarily nine oil seeds that are primary source of vegetable oils in India. These include soya bean, groundnut, rapeseed, mustard, sunflower, safflower, seasonum, niger and castor and linseed. Among these, the highest production is of soya bean, which is about 34%. This is followed by groundnut, which accounts for about 27% of the total oil seed production. And then it is followed by rapeseed and mustard. And all these three account for about 88% of the total oil seed productions in India. So clearly, soybean contributes or accounts for the highest amongst the total oil seed production in India. Now, which are the states that are contributing to the production? So the states like Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat, they are famous for groundnut. Haryana is famous for mustard. Karnataka for groundnut. MP for soya bean, Maharashtra also for soya bean, Rajasthan for both mustard and soya bean, Tamil Nadu for groundnut, UP for mustard, West Bengal for mustard and all these states contribute for about 95% of the total oil seed productions in the country. And in addition to these nine primary oil seed sources, there are secondary sources from which the oil is extracted. These include cotton seed, rice bran, coconut, tree born oil seeds and oil palm. So these are the secondary sources of vegetable oils while these are the primary sources from which vegetable oil is produced in India. And what is the present status of oil seeds and vegetable oil production in India? So you should all be aware that almost 70% of the oil seeds are cultivated in rain fed areas. Rain fed areas means these are the areas which are heavily dependent on the monsoon rains or they are deficient in the rains and that is why these are the areas which do not have supply of irrigation. So 70% of the oil seeds are cultivated in these rain fed areas. We all know that Rajasthan, Gujarat etc. do not receive high amounts of monsoonal rainfall. Then in 2019 and 20, the domestic availability of the edible oils from both primary and secondary sources was only about 10.65 million tons. And this was against the total domestic demand of 24 million tons. So what was the total demand? It was about 24 million ton. But how much could we produce? We could produce only 10.65 million tons. So there was a gap of about 13 million tons, which had to be imported. So in 2019-20, the country imported about 13.35 million tons of edible oil, which accounted for about 61,559 crores. And it accounts for about 56% of the total demand. So more than 50% of the vegetable oil demand of India is met through imports which is a very important fact for us. Further these imports comprise of mainly palm oil which accounts for about 7 million tons. Secondly soya bean is also imported which accounts for about 3.5 million tons and sunflower oil which is about 2.5 million tons. That is 
the highest share in the import of the vegetable oil is of palm oil which accounts for 7 million tons or is the highest contributor in the imports. The major sources of these imports are Argentina and Brazil for soybean oil, Indonesia and Malaysia for palm oil, Ukraine and Argentina for sunflower oil. Now due to demand and supply mismatch, India has emerged as the largest importer of vegetable oils in the world followed by China and United States of America. And out of these edible oils or imported edible oils, the share of palm oil is about 60% which is followed by soybean oil and sunflower oil. So all these facts that we have discussed here are important that more than 56% of the vegetable oil demand is met through imports and amongst the imports, palm oil accounts for the highest share that is around 60%. Now it is said that the prices in India are being impacted because of the international prices. We already know that mainly 56% of the oil demand is met through imports and that is why any fluctuation in the international prices will also be reflected in the prices in the domestic market. And as the international prices are rising, the prices of the edible oil are also rising in the domestic market. Now why are the international prices rising in the first place? So the countries worldwide have been focusing on making biofuel from vegetable oil. So the original purpose of the vegetable oil is now being diverted into making of biofuel. That is one of the biggest causes of increase in the prices of edible oil internationally. Secondly, there has been shifting of edible oils from food basket to fuel basket. So this is also same reason. Then there has been a thrust on making renewable fuel from soybean oil in the United States of America and Brazil and other countries. That is, the oil or vegetable oil is being diverted from its primary use to the secondary use like renewable fuel or biofuel etc. And these are some of the causes of concern and that are increasing the demand of the vegetable oil and accordingly the prices are also witnessing fluctuation and that too on the higher side. Now besides the demand reason there is also supply constraint that is being witnessed in terms of production of vegetable oil and this is because of the issues that are being faced in the United States of America and various other countries. Now in United States of America there is lower than expected planting intentions that is the planting of soybean in the United States of America is likely to be impacted. And this is because of below average temperatures and dry conditions that are prevalent in parts of United States of America, which are mainly soybean growing regions. And because of this, the supply prospects for the upcoming 2021 and 22 season is under dark clouds. Further, because of prolonged dry conditions in Argentina, it is expecting lower than anticipated yields of vegetable oil. So these are two reasons related to supply while the demand has increased because the vegetable oil is being diverted for generation of biofuels or the renewable fuels. So these are the demand side factors and these are the supply side factors which relate to the dryness in the United States of America and Argentina regarding lower production of such vegetable oil or oil seeds which are used for vegetable oil production.